launch our Motivation Talks. So Motivation Talks is a series of talks and interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential game changers who are defying stereotypes and reshaping society around them. I really could not be prouder, happier, to introduce my friend, the actor, playwright, director, artistic director of Baltimore Stage, Kwame Kwaya Amar. Please welcome to the stage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Kanya. I have to say, um, it was really good seeing the video, um, knowing how much you and your organization have contributed, not just to music, but to culture but to, to Britain. I, I, I said to you on the phone, I remember back in the day, and this ages me, when uh, Idris Elba called me and he said, boy, can we get a squeeze into the MOBO dance? <laughs> and, and we were like young then, we were like, I don't know, you know, but let's just turn up at the door, let's just see what we can do. And uh, I mean, like you were knocking it out of the park then. No, we didn't, but, I like it. but it was all right. We, we were happy to just stand outside and glow, uh, you know, look at all of the stars walking by and go, yeah, 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 kind of lie and say, yeah, we were there, you know. Um, but uh, again, I, I, I thank you profoundly for helping to change the landscape. Um, it's, it's phenomenally important that we have game changers, not just, as David said, in front of the camera, but behind organizing promoting it's a it's a very beautiful thing so thank you I congratulate you <laughs> all right I'm not I'm not on Twitter I'm just gonna look at my notes um, you know Kanye and I spoke yesterday and she said what, what, what is this called what, what, what did you talk about I, go, I don't know and um, you know when we started vibing around um, you know what is in a name um, you know and for me that's a really important thing because um, a name is, it's far more than just an identifier. Often in, in, in many cultures, your name tells you who you must become. Um, and it is a must. Your parents tell you with that, that you will grow to greatness, that you will be kind, that you will think of others. Um, and though many who may know my history, or any who may know my history, know that I reclaimed my, my ancestral name. But actually, that wasn't the biggest name or title, actually, that I had a struggle with. The, the thing I had the biggest struggle with was, was calling myself artist. Of knowing that with that comes great responsibility. But it, more importantly, actually, a whole raft of negative stereotypes. And when we think about the artist, we think about divas. And we think about making sure that the actor is sent a car in the morning so that they turn up on set on time. It's a set of kind of, no, we must look after them because, you know, the, everything about them is about the internal, is about looking after them. And that sometimes there are connotations that, that the artist can be this irresponsible being that can produce genius, but actually in the real world doesn't function properly. Um, many of us know those stereotypes. And we know a couple of people who fulfill those stereotypes. Um, but I would say, actually, that on the whole, um, the artist that I know and the artist that I respect actually um, stand for something that they believe and they discover at some point in their journey that art is about more than the self. Being the artist is about more than just standing and basking in the glory or the applause. Each civilization, as far as I, as I can see, is remembered not by, and, and no disrespect, but by their accountants or not by even their, their political greats, but is remembered through their great works of art. If I say ancient Egypt, we think about the, the pyramids. If I say Greece, we think about their men of letters, their women of letters, we think about their plays. If I call anywhere, if I go to Mexico, if I go to the Aztecs, we think the first thing that comes up actually is the art, because the art speaks deeper than just the surface. The art says, this is not just who we are now, but who we crave to be. The art stand as an, stands as an ideal. And then, that civilization tries to achieve those ideals. So it was a struggle when I first wanted to work out 
what being an artist really meant. Um, I, I wouldn't have mentioned this bit, but there's some people in here who know me from right back in the day, so I'm gonna have to go there. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it, Paula? It's you, you know. Um, and uh, I first began as, uh, as a singer. And when I was singing as a kid, I always thought that was what, that's what I was going to do and that's what I was going to be and blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, I, I got to about the age of about 18. And at that time, I was, um, I was hooked up with this very big star at the time who was a, who was a songwriter. And, um, and I was told, well, look, you can't write songs, so uh, this person will write songs for you and then we'll get you a recording deal and then Bob's your uncle. It's all going to go. And I sat around for a year and a half waiting for this superstar who would call me when they were in LA or when they were with another big superstar saying, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to you. Yeah, I'm gonna get to you. I'm gonna write you that song. I'm gonna get you that hit. And I kind of sat around waiting for about a year and a half. And, and I, I, don't, I didn't recognize it then, but my mother described me as going into a kind of existential depression. That thing where you know what you want and you know what you need and you know what you feel you deserve, but it is not in your purview. It's not in your hands. You can't make it happen. So I remember sitting at home one day when I, at 19, was saying, you know what, if I, if I, you know, if I die now, it's all good. You know, I mean, God, I can't imagine that I thought that at that point. I thought, oh, I've lived a life. I've, you know, but, um, and then I decided that I would teach myself to... Um, to play an instrument and to write my own songs. And so I started doing that. And then that grew to, you know, to learning to mix and to produce and getting yourself your own home studio. Remember back in the day, man, that was big things, man, where you had your home studio and big money that, you know, that we spent to, to kind of get there. And, you know, it went on and I kind of got some development deals at Sony and then East West LA. And every time it looked like I was just about to, to hit it, something would happen and the deal would fall through. And it would. And I remember waking up at about 24, and I went, I think this is going to kill me. I think, I, I, at that time, I was young, so I thought I had every, as much definition as I needed. Um, that was back in the day. So what doesn't kill you defines you. I had the definition, so I figured it was going to kill me. So I woke up one morning, and I just said, and I called on my friends. And at the time, I think my studio was worth about 50 grand. And, I, and it was hard work, you know, and I, and I, I called my friends and I said, who wants to come and get a mixing desk? Who wants to come and get a sampler? Who wants to come and get? And I just gave everything away. Um, ironically, I had an M1 keyboard for anybody who remembers those back in the day. And, um, and I gave that away and I ran into it um, in Senegal five years ago. <laughs> and I was like 15, I'd given it like 20 years ago and I won't bore you with that story, but I had my name scratched on the bottom. I was like, that's me, what are you doing here? <laughs> and you're still working? Um, you know, minus about 10 keys, but alas. Um, and, and then I, so when I gave up and I, and I realized that I, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't for me, it was too hard. And one of the beautiful things actually about life is that it is a circle and not a straight line. My, my firstborn son, also called Kwame, would sit on my lap and would press, you know, the, back in the day, the old samplers where you go, uh, 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 and he would, bang his head on my mixing desk. And, uh, and now he's a producer, and in fact, a couple of his acts are nominated for the Mobos this year. Um, which is, you know, that's not a, that's, that's the all, that's, you know, that's, uh, and, um, but that, that, that aside, and I remember waking up and going, okay, so who, Kwame, are you now? Now that the thing that you defined yourself by from the moment you were 10, to now, what happens, where is your art? And I was an actor as well, but acting was my day job, man, as far as I was concerned. My heart was in that. And I didn't know what to do with my art because I didn't feel that I was a good enough actor, actually, to make acting the art that could change something. An actor on the whole invariably waits for the parts to come and then, and I was like, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I read Marcus Garvey. This is about self-determination. How are you going to just sit there and just wait for it to come to you? It doesn't work that way. Stand up, find, do. And so uh, I taught myself to write. And I became a, a writer. And why that was important is because I remember one day there was a group of us um, back in the day that, and that were working well. 
And the BBC that season decided to do a whole, and ITV at the time, decided to only do period dramas. And in those period dramas, of course, at that time, they didn't have black actors, so none of us were working. And we'd meet every month around a friend's house or a different friend's house, and we would moan, and oh my God, they're not letting us in, and oh my God, there's no work. In fact, I remember meeting someone, I was trying to go quickly, Ed, but never mind. <laughs> no, no, <don't. laughs> um, and, and I remember, actually, um, I, I lived in Tottenham at the time, and one of these very famous actors now, um, I met him in Tottenham Sainsbury's. And I was a bit like, bro, what are you doing in Sainsbury's? You live in South London. And he said, yeah, you know what? I, I put the answer machine on, and I figured if I drive for at least two hours, go to another part of town, and I get back, there'll be a message on the answer machine from my agent. And you know, I remember that's how we lived. And then I remember, and I think that is my mobile going off, and I'm gonna switch that off right now, sorry, thank you. And, um, and I remember saying, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna sit here and just moan and talk about quote unquote the man or the woman who was in control of our destiny? And so I decided that I had to write. Not just for me, not so I could star in it, not as a vehicle, but write because actually what we were talking about was the lack of stories. The stories that came from us, that was about us, that validated us, that critiqued us. And so one started to write in order to do that. And I was fortunate that that happened and then those plays started happening at the National. And I got to that point where my directors that were coming in um, to direct the pieces were all white. And I was like, do we not have a black director here that, that could interpret this work? And at the time it was deemed that actually there were not a black, any black directors who could do that work. So I, I worked with this one wonderful director and one, he couldn't do one of the plays. And so we went on this wild search to find someone else and this director that, we, that came in actually really messed up this play. I won't say the name of the play, or, but uh, really messed it up. And I sat there saying to myself, what do I do? Do I sit here and do I moan? Do I sit here and, no, I will try and, and learn to direct. So I started to learn to direct. I started asking people if I could sit in their rehearsal rooms. I started reading. I started flying between here and the United States and looking at different directors' works. And ultimately, I was trying to do that, not to self-aggrandize, not to be the Renaissance man, not to put on these hats, but ultimately to believe and to support the notion of self-determination that you are in control of telling your stories. And the moment you cease to be in control of telling your stories, the story gets bastardized, the story gets reduced, it gets diluted, it becomes something that you recognize through the lens of translation and not through the lens of your own eyes. And so I started to direct. And then I started directing, and then I started looking around at, at different artistic directing posts, and I started moaning about what they were doing and what plays they were putting on. I was finding that invariably black plays sat in two camps. The black Holocaust play, set in Africa, or the black underclass play that was set somewhere in the urban inner city. And the black middle class or aspirational class just did not exist. And I would see many writers who were born into the middle classes and born into the black middle classes doing, yeah, blood, what's going on? And then it blood in their plays all of the time. And I was like going, that's fine. But is there any diversity? And they would say, um, look at what is being produced. And so that which is being produced sets the tone. I had to move from there to saying, how do I become a gatekeeper? Less about me and more, I hate complaining. My mother, who is my profoundest and most brilliant role model, always said, do not complain until you have walked in someone's moccasins. And so, by whatever one believes in, um, the next big name that I had to adjust to was that of artistic director. And out of the blue, the president of Senegal called via someone else and said, we've got this festival called the World Festival of Black Arts and Culture in Senegal, 50 countries, 55 from around the world, and we want to do a big international festival, and will you come and be the artistic director? Up until that point, the largest thing I directed was a five-person play at the tricycle. And they were saying, come and do, uh, di write and direct the opening ceremony with a cast of five to 700. And as I sat there and I went, 
uh, and, they, and we met in London and they said, so will you? And I was like, uh, okay, okay. I, if I believe that the role of the artist is to give, being asked by Africa to produce something of that scale is huge, but I'm crapping myself. But I said yes. Um, and it was a tremendously fascinating experience, one that, that I felt nearly broke me. But when I came through it, I felt infinitely stronger. And it was almost as if, and it's very interesting, I'm doing this play, as you know, at the Donmar Warehouse at the moment called One Night in Miami. And that's a play about, that one's not me, and, and this, that's a play about Cassius Clay, who's about to become Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke, all in one hotel room. It's the night that he beat Sonny Liston, and everybody expected him to lose, and he won. And then he went back to Malcolm X's house, um, Malcolm X's um, hotel room, and the next day, he emerged as Muhammad Ali. He came out to the world and said, I am a member of the Nation of Islam, when he's at its top, right? And this play fundamentally is about what is the role of the artist, the entertainer, the thinker? How do we serve our community? And for me, now as the artistic director of Baltimore Center Stage, the biggest thing that I have to challenge myself with, and I think I have now only just come to terms with the name, with the title, artist with its responsibilities, the responsibilities to serve one's community. As a foreigner, my community is Baltimore, it's 700,000, and then the greater community outside of that. When Trayvon Martin was killed and Zimmerman got off, I looked in the eyes of my staff and I looked at the eyes of people around me in Baltimore and I saw existential angst. I saw parents, mothers and fathers say, I don't know how to raise my child anymore because the old orthodoxies of putting your hands up, the old orthodoxies of not being rude, the old orthodoxies of just being quiet and holding it down does not suffice anymore. That you can be slain for no reason other than the obvious. And I remember coming back to work, because actually I was here when Zimmerman got off for a day, and saying to my then head of marketing, I said, what, what can we do as we looked around seeing this pain? And we came up with an idea where we went, okay, well, let's, let's serve the communities that is most in pain. Let's commission 10 artists. Let's send those artists into the very streets of East and West Baltimore that you guys have seen on the wire. Let's go in, let's go into the houses, let's go into the community centers, and let those, uh, let those artists perform and then lead a discussion at the end of that about not police brutality, not about not about that part of it, but about how we as a community re-equip ourselves, give ourselves the tools to confront the terror that is happening on the streets across America right now. And some might argue in Britain. As an artist, I could feel some people in the office going, oh my God, that's really dangerous. Oh my God, we're gonna lose some of our, our patrons. Or some of our older white patrons are gonna go, this is political. And Ultimately, it is sitting firmly within the skin of going, as an artist, my job is to be a catalyst for a debate. The debate that says, look at yourself. Are you happy with what you see in the mirror? And if you're not happy with what you see, what are you going to do about it? The job of the artist is to reflect. The job of the artist is to motivate everybody around you to be their better self. Not to be their most selfish, their smallest, their most fearful self. But how do we, as I would, do, I, I often say as the fourth pillar of government, how do we make sure that we as artists tell the world, be the best that you can be, but more importantly, show it to them in their complexities. Crack the mirror, break the glass. 
See yourself in your ugliness and then ask yourself, do I wish to stay here? And so I end really by saying that I'm overjoyed to be back in England directing here at the Donmar, which is a brilliant theatre, a radical theatre. A theatre where its artistic directors and, and, and producers are dedicated to using art in its most profoundest. It's a, it's a joy to be home. It's frightening being home post-Brexit, I won't lie. Um, it feels like one's taking a step back to the bad old days when I was a child and xenophobia was a thing that was just accepted and to challenge it would be a mark against you. It's, it's hard being home and looking around and looking at the theaters in Britain and asking where are the African Caribbean or African artistic directors and leaders. That's really painful that I, that I can't name very many. It's not that better in the United States. There are 700 what we call Lort theaters, budgeted theaters with a budget of over a million or not and, and, and more. As it stands right now, I'm the only black artistic director, which is horrible. To come home and find it almost the same is almost sinful. And so as much as I enjoy being home, as much as it's wonderful, as much as the infrastructure work that is being done is magnificent, I ride back home, I switch on my television, and I see far more faces of color than I did five years ago. I'm not sure that the faces behind the producers, that that's changed as dramatically as it should. And there is our fight. There lies our fight as artists, as citizens. We must have to let our country operate and look in the way it looks when I'm walking down the South Bank. So I end by saying thank you for your advocation. I end by saying it is our challenge, everyone in here who associates with the name artist. And I don't mind whether you're in front of the camera or your producerial. The challenge I leave us all with is how do we create the best catalysts for change? That change starts in us, goes to our families, it goes on to our communities, but it resides really heavily in our nation. That is our responsibility. That is what we were placed here to do if we wish to call ourselves artists. Thank you.